and smile? I do. 24 brand new hours are before me and I vow to use each and every one of it to its maximum. I'm an entrepreneur and time is my currency. But with this thought, you know, I share an anxiety that time is passing and that everything is impermanent and transitory. But I'm reminded of the great Albert Einstein. He said, time and space are modes in which we think, not conditions in which we live. 70 years ago, rocket-borne cameras gave us the very first look of planet Earth from the outer part of space. It was the very first time in human history we could actually look back on our planet and see it in its entirety. It was really a monumental moment where we could turn around and not only see the universe, but it began a profound shift in the understanding of ourselves. It provided an awakening, you know, it changed our self-image and the narrative that was in our mind. It enabled us to really drive a mission to the edge. And when we begin thinking about this, the Hubble Space Telescope has given us nothing more than an awakening, and it's enabled us to really understand and contemplate the meaning of space and time. What does this mean? When I look at the deep field photograph right here, you know, for me to be able to gaze at something so impossibly large and fit it into the optic nerve, which is something so incredibly small, really enables me to think for a moment about not only the fabric of time, but what does this mean for the future? And as I stare at this photo, you know, I can see the formation of diamonds being created in the galaxy and the nursery of stars. And each of those light forms represent all elements of human form today. And so as we start to gaze at this photo, we start to contemplate what is the meaning of what we put forward when it comes to technology. And you have to start saying to yourself again, Albert was right. Time and space are modes in which we think. It's definitely not a condition in which we live. You know, as humans, we've created some of the most ambitious outcomes. We've done incredibly well with technology. And the internet, as we know it today, is an outstanding success. More than three billion people are connected around the globe. Around a zettabyte of data is shared on a daily basis and technical advancements are pulling our world into a digital form. How we use technology today transcends how we've used it before and in all elements of our past. And as we contemplate the internet and how we use it, billions of people around the globe are connected. We have around four billion devices now, connected cars and factories, wearable tech, clothes, even our homes. And as we start to use this fundamental fabric, it has really become the economic instrument of our time. But what happens when an economic instrument fails? Well, we don't have to go too far to remember what happened in the global financial crisis in 2008, an earth-shattering event of economic failure. that started with Wall Street and went to London and Singapore and Tokyo. There was not a country in the world that was left unaffected by this problem. And so as we think about what does this mean around trust, we were left in the rubble and shattering of economic trust and how does this affect us? And what would happen if we had a new technology that enabled us to actually have the fabric of the internet rebirth? When we think about what happened with the internet, Web 2.0 came where users became creators of content and as we started to use this even more in publishing tools, Facebook would be larger than China today as a country. And as these tools propagate now from beyond just the computer in front of you to your hand, we really are facing an economic opportunity. So when these central authorities are lacking trust, we also have another problem that begins to unfold. Let's consider what Web.3 could be. We really are at a point now when we're starting to consider a transactional trust layer of the internet, where we move from what we once knew as the World Wide Web to the World Wide Ledger. And this is blockchain. 
It's a new technology that's fundamentally going to change the way we trade, and it might even change the way we think. If we think about Facebook, most of us have our data stored in their central repository. And what if we could have that data sitting in a distributed ledger across the globe that you controlled, that you had the key? You had the ability to give access to that to your bank or insurance company or to the government, rather than the other way around. And if we were able to do this, what would this mean? Well, I think it's probably going to take a little while for Facebook to change the way they think, but there are some industries that have already embraced this technology. Diamonds being one of them. Three billion dollars, three billion years in the making, formed under the pressure of time. Diamonds, a commodity that is close to each of our hearts, as we have a defined love of luxury. It's a symbol of love, commitment, and trust. But can we trust diamonds? And when we read the headlines, it's plagued with fraud and synthetics, blood diamonds, funding terrorism activity. Really, the romance of diamonds is truly compromised. Blockchain as a technology is a ledger that enables us to track and trace the ownership and provenance of goods. It really is a chronology of time, enabling us to see where the diamonds have come from and which hands they've passed through through the supply chain. It is a moment for us to be able to look back, just as we did from outer space, to see the world in its entirety. So imagine if this technology was available in World War II. Around 20% of the art was looted in Europe by the Nazis, and shamelessly. People were stripped of their assets, their family heirlooms, and their identity. And there's still around 100,000 art pieces today, where they have not been returned to their rightful owners. Museums and art collectors are all plagued with these ideas of being able to be sure to check the provenance of goods and items. And if we had this ledger, we would have been able to do that. Museums today. Are checking the authenticity of those goods and to be sure that the provenance, and if they are to be found to come from a looted um, uh, backbone, that they will change, they will implicitly return it to their rightful owner if the evidence so produces. But what evidence? Shoe boxes and receipts and paper records. This technology enables us to be able to store these on a ledger that's secured. So what does that mean? This technology could transcend time, but it could also transcend our lifetime. Each and every one of us in this room today. So the ring on your finger that you'll pass to your daughter for her wedding, and the watch on your wrist to your son, the art in your home to your grandchildren. Finally, we have a technology that will enable us to support this endeavour. So the rule, the, the role of human imagination, is to actually conceive the delightful. The most impressive futures, and have the ability to get out of bed and bring this forward to today as a technology platform, and that's what we're doing. And as entrepreneurs, this is what empowers us. We bring our imagining into existence, and as technology advances, we've found ways to outsource our mental capacity into our technology. We've been able to shrink the lag time from imagination into implementation, and that's just within in my lifetime. So, if I was to take a Hubble telescope and look back on my life, what would it mean, and what would I see? Well, fundamentally, I believe it's about being a little savvy and having a good pair of pink boots to start the day. But beyond that, it's not about just learning the technology and the ones and zeros and the coding. Mind you, that helps a little. It's really about understanding where the technology fabric can take us, what problems are we are solving, and really make a decision to act. And that's exactly what happened. But don't get me wrong; not everything I've done has been successful. In fact, one was an epic failure. I remember WAP. I'm not sure that anyone knows what that is in the room, but I remember waking up one morning thinking this is one of the most transformative technologies of our time. And with 30 engineers by our side, you know, I set upon a path blindly, building on top of this thing called WAP. And we built a product quickly and took it to the biggest names in corporate Australia. And it was successful. The technology worked, but overnight, WAP just literally disappeared, and all of a sudden, WAP had had its time. But this technology today is something that we fundamentally need. The web is our fundamental economic instrument of today, and yet the fabric of what's been built 
is not able to support it. So this technology is here to stay. Now with Everledger, we're tracking the world's diamonds as a way to reduce blood markets, black markets, and fraud. And it's our greatest life adventure to date. But one thing, of course, that you must remain cognizant of is that time is a currency, and it can only be spent once. And just like the grain of sand in an hourglass, we are moved by the moments of gravity. And if we take a moment to consider what the future looks like, we have all the tools available to us to enable it to become a reality. So thanks, Albert, because you were right. Time and space are moments in which we think. And there's no way it's a condition in which I'm going to live. Thank you. <laughs>